Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad in Wyoming. I'm Mark Pruitt, Ash Pit Mucker Router. Today is December 3rd, 2021. That's why the Christmas tree, we're in the middle of holiday season here in the United States. This is layout update number 25. I apologize, I've got a bit of a cold right now, so I probably sound a little stuffy. But hopefully, kind of offsetting that, is the new microphone that I've got that means I no longer have to shout at my cell phone in order for it to pick up the audio when I'm filming these little opening intros. While onto the layout, I got quite a bit done this past month in terms of new bench work, new subroad bed, new road bed, and new track. And that doesn't even mention the wiring that I did. Let's go take a look at it all, shall we? Last month's update ended with super elevation tape having been placed at the curve out of Powder River and the roadbed ready for track at the Chauvin turnout. I also had the beginnings of the Wind River Canyon and Thermopolis benchwork installed. Picking up from that point, by the 5th I had the curve past Powder River laid and the Chauvin turnout seen at the far right of this photo built and installed. Four days later, I had the peninsula benchwork complete, except for cross bracing on the legs. Here we're looking down the finished peninsula. The benchwork will never look so pristine again, which is a good thing. There's something vaguely obscene about naked benchwork, isn't there? So right after this shot was taken, I began installing the subroad bed for the Chicago and Northwestern line to Riverton. Here's how things looked on the 10th of the month. I had the subroad bed for the first curve of the Burlington line installed past Chauvin and began putting in the CNW subroad bed. The CNW line climbs from Chauvin to Riverton on the peninsula, but that grade looked pretty steep. I went back to the track plan and checked it, and sure enough the design showed close to 2%. Still, the line seemed to be climbing a lot faster than it should be. I measured the height at the end of the roadbed and compared that to what the plan showed, and sure enough, I was several inches above where the plan indicated. What was going on? My Micromark digital level showed the right grade, so I was beginning to think that maybe it was inaccurate. Then I took a closer look. Well, crap! The level was reading in degrees, not percent. My grade was planned for 2%, so how much was I off? The level toggles between degrees and percent, but when it's turned on, it always starts in degrees. I need to remember to always switch it to percent to get a correct reading. But for my near 2% grade, what's the corresponding degrees of slope? It certainly isn't 2 degrees. In fact, it's only 1.1 degrees. No wonder the line was climbing too fast. It turns out I was installing the CNW line to an almost 3.5% grade. Yow! So about midnight on the 11th of the month, I went back and regraded the installed subroad bed. It looked a lot better. Having fixed the grade, on the 12th I put in cork road bed on the installed parts of the CNW line subroad bed. Because of the cost of commercial road bed, for the lower profile lines, I cut my own roadbed strips from the same 3mm cork roll I use for yards and industries. So I took a day and cut a bunch of 4 foot long roadbed strips. This short clip demonstrates how I do it. First I position the roll so that the cork edge is on a flat surface, in this case one of my not yet used benchwork stringers. Using a 4 inch steel rule as the cutting guide, I position it 5 eighths of an inch from the edge of the cork. I use an adjustable square to get consistent width at both ends of the cork and from piece to piece. Sorry about the occasionally poor camera view, but I think you get the idea. As I measure each end, I clamp the rule firmly in place. Then I take a utility knife and cut along the rule in several passes to get a strip of road bed.
Uh, that noise in the background is my clock chiming the hour, by the way. Once I have the strip of roadbed cut, I simply repeat the process until I have enough for the task at hand. In this case, I cut enough roadbed to complete the line across the entire peninsula. On the 14th, I got back to installing CNW subroadbed, working my way through the turnback curve on the free end of the peninsula and beginning to head back down the other direction. This clip shows how I lay the cork roadbed I just cut. I basically do it the same way for the Midwest cork roadbed on the main line also. I use yellow glue since I'm installing the cork on plywood, but on foam I use adhesive caulk. You can use the caulk on plywood too, but the glue is just a bit cheaper, I think. I spread a bead of glue along the cork, then spread it along the entire width with my finger. Yeah, I just wipe the excess from my finger on any convenient spot on the benchwork or subroadbed. It'll all be buried under scenery anyway, so why not? Then I place the glued roadbed in its final location. On curves, I use pins at the ends to hold it in place while the glue tacks up. The final step is to roll a wallpaper seam roller along the roadbed strip to flatten it and squeeze out any excess glue. Note that the ends of the subroadbed strips are staggered. Wasn't that fun? On the 17th, I had track laid partways up the CNW line and I ran a train up the grade to test it out. This track looks really wavy but a lot of that is because the camera angle emphasizes the waviness. Since this track is all hidden, I'm only concerned with train performance, not appearance. The train handles the waviness without a problem, so the track is straight enough. The CNW track from the Showbon turnout is Code 70 Pico Flex Track, but I have tons of Code 100 Atlas Flex Track salvaged from an earlier iteration of the layout. Rather than use the expensive new Pico stuff for all that hidden track work, once the line is out of sight, I switch to the Atlas track. This shot shows the transition. The Atlas track is on the left. I wasn't sure I could do a direct connection from code 70 to code 100. I thought I might have to go through a short bit of code 83 track to get a smooth transition. But it wasn't hard at all to get a smooth joint at the 70 to 100 transition. Since running the first train from Casper through Shoban was a bit of an event, I made a little movie of the occasion. Here, the CNW train rounds the roundhouse as it leaves Casper. About a hundred miles later, <laughs> the train reaches Shoban and takes the diverging route towards Riverton and Lander. As you can see, the Burlington line hasn't been laid yet. And finally, we see that the consolidation has no trouble at all hauling the short train up the almost 2% grade toward Riverton. At this point, I switched over to the Burlington Wind River Canyon line and began working out the alignment through that area. By the 19th, I'd worked out the first part of the line and had subroad bed installed well into the canyon. On this line, we're progressing through the canyon on about a 1.5% downgrade. By the 20th of the month, I had road bed installed on the new alignment, and on the 21st, I laid track into the area. That curve partway down the line of soda cans is a 70 inch radius. To the left of the track, mostly in the aisleway, is the Wind River. To the right is the rugged mountains and often sheer cliff faces of the canyon. There are also several short tunnels that will appear along this line. Here's what I'm hoping to capture in one particular spot, without the streamliner of course. I put together a video of the first trains through Chopin, which I put up on YouTube last week. 
Here's a bit of that video showing the first train on the canyon trackage. I'll put a link to the video in the description, unless I forget later. This train will be typical of train lengths on the Burlington line. The one in the clip you saw earlier will be typical of the trains to Riverton and Lander. It's now the 23rd of the month, and I'm busy fitting in the Burlington turnback curve at the end of the peninsula. Here, another problem cropped up. The plan called out a 34-inch radius curve, which looks great on paper, but in real life the curve looks way too close to the higher 30-inch curve on the CNW line. This would require almost vertical walls between the two curves, and while that's fine on the entry to the turnbacks, which is in the canyon itself, at the Thermopolis side exit from that curve, the canyon is ending and there has to be a bit less verticality to the scenery. To fix this problem, I went back and built a 36 inch radius subroad bed curve for the Burlington turnback. Here it is stood up along with the 34 inch radius curve. An additional two inches added doesn't seem like a whole lot, but with the canyon end of the curve in the same location, that gives me an extra four inches on the Thermopolis side. That made all the difference. Here's the 34 inch radius curve at the Thermopolis exit from the canyon again, and here's the 36 inch radius curve. By the 26th of the month, I had the final position of the Burlington turnback curve set and tied in with the subroad bed on the canyon side of the peninsula. Then I turned briefly to wiring. Here, still on the 26th, I'm running the bus wires for the Burlington Main Line at the entrance to the peninsula. On the 27th, it was back to track work. I installed roadbed nearly to the end of the Burlington turnback curve, then installed track up to the curve on the canyon side. I couldn't go beyond this point because I need to super elevate the curve, which requires a lead out to be in place on the Thermopolis side. I don't have the Thermopolis trackage planned out in detail yet, so I can install the lead out roadbed. That should happen early in December. By the 29th, I install track all the way through the CNW turnback curve. Here I'm installing a stick of flex track in the middle of the curve. I use my camera tripod to hold the flex track at the correct elevation while I solder it to the previous section, which gives me a smooth curve right through the joint after I curve the new piece into position. After completing installation of the curve, I ran a train up to the new end of track to make sure everything was good. Then on November 30th, it was back to wiring. I spent the day extending the bus wires for both the Burlington and the CNW power districts to the end of the peninsula and installing feeders for all installed track. The red and green wires are the Burlington power district and the white and black ones are the CNW district. And finally for the month, I started installing the TCS Wow Sound kit that I bought a few months ago into my Bachmann 10 wheeler. Here I've gotten as far as drilling holes in the bottom of the tender where the speaker will go. I'll finish up this installation in a day or two. And at this point we're up to date. December's plan is to continue pushing the CNW closer to Riverton and building the Burlington into Thermopolis. Then I may start on the scenery base for the Wind River Canyon and put up some cardboard strips along the sub roadbed edge for the CNW track. Even though I'm pretty confident in my track work, I still cringe when those trains are on the track with nothing to stop them from falling all the way to the floor should a derailment occur. I'm planning a trip to Thermopolis about two hours from here in the next day or so to visit the county museum to collect some data about rail served industries in Thermopolis back in the 1930s and 40s. Then I'll be able to plan the track arrangement in Thermopolis in detail. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe, have a really great Christmas, and I'll see you next month.